So several years ago, it might have been maybe, I don't know, four years ago, five years ago or something at the, the Hayden Eagles, um, I met Chris and we started talking about potentially doing some different projects, maybe some manufacturing at uh, uh, one of his companies overseas and uh, um, had a particular interest in the uh, interferometer, which the, uh, everybody familiar with what an interferometer is, like Mickelson Morley and there's been, uh, you know, d different variations of that and I know in 2008, uh, around there, somebody named Martin Gruznick uh, contacted me, showed me an interesting video of uh, an interferometer in a different position, which is kind of what this presentation will kind of go heavily into. And in my, I kind of showed it in uh, my presentation, Hacking the Ether, uh, several years back, which is kind of my little layman simplified ether unified field model. Uh, basically, it's the, kind of the world according to Aaron, <laughs> how this stuff kind of works. And uh, over the years, you know, uh, James DeMeo, uh, he passed earlier this year? or Yeah, it was actually, la oh wow, it's been that long, around maybe Mar uh, April of last year. James DeMeo had done a handful of presentations at uh, the last several conferences on uh, Oregon and also um, on the ether. And he has compiled, you know, more information on experiments showing the validity of the ether than probably anybody else. And little by little, as uh, Chris and I were talking about that, and we started to uh, correspond, you know, more with James DeMeo, who was completely, um, uh, you know, he was wanting to get involved with everything that you're going to be le learning about right here. Unfortunately, you know, he's not uh, with us anymore. Um, but uh, Chris uh, has been based in Asia for about 15 plus years specializing in uh, hardware manufacturing for aerospace, uh, heavy-duty trucks, solar power systems, and uh, he was inspired by Mar Martin Grusnick's uh, self-built Mickelson um, interferometer experiment, which has a little twist that most people haven't seen before from the, the classical way it's been done. And uh, Chris has uh, examined and modified the Grusnick device to compare results. And this presentation will cover a brief overview of the ether drift concepts, experiments, and will be followed by analysis of 130 turns uh, of the machine and 3,336 data point, points uh, from this modified version of the Grusnik style interferometer. Please help me welcome Chris Machado. The idea was to understand better the nature of uh, light and uh, the ether. And so the device looks, this was the original device, has a uh, laser here, a beam splitter here, a half silver mirror there, two mirrors uh, uh, on both those arms, and then a eyepiece for viewing. And so uh, uh, the laser will hit here, it'll split to both sides, uh, one, one here and one here. They'll bounce back and recombine uh, at the beam splitter, and the interference pattern can be viewed from, from uh, the eyepiece. And so the idea is if you see a change, if you see the, the interference pattern moving, then you know that there's a change, uh, there's something different between one side and the other. And so uh, the idea was that only a device like this, this sensitive, would be able to sense uh, ether if it's in fact there. And so uh, if you consider, um, well, actually, we'll, we'll go to the next slide first. So this was the final device in 1887 that did the famous uh, Michelson-Morley experiment. That experiment uh, was so key to everything we understand in physics or how the mod you know, mainstream physics is understood now because it, it was done right at the time that Einstein, or right around the time that Einstein came up with his relativity, general and, um, anyway, general relativity. And so, so the 1887 model was much larger. It was 22 meter light paths between uh, the beam splitter and the mirror. Now, if you can see there, several other mirrors were added to each arm so that you got um, several reflections before it returned to the beam splitter and the interference pattern was projected and it could be viewed. Down here are some, uh, some snapshots of what the interference pattern looked like. They call them the fringes. Okay. All right, so historically, the ether field model has been the dominant theory throughout uh, human civilization, the highest levels of physical science, um, up until relativity. Uh, then the battle heated up, as I said, and there, were, there was kind of two communities um, battling back and forth. Uh, the bifurcation of the scientific community was the American 
uh, group in general and the European group in general. Uh, but on the American side, we did have you know, Isaac Newton, Nikola, Nikola Tesla, and several others that did not subscribe to Einstein's relativity. They thought it was you know, uh, fairy dust, you know, making things up, imagination, uh, because you have action at a distance. Nothing between the sun and the earth, but light propagates. How could that be possible? Okay. All right, so to this day in our, phys on our physics books in universities, that's what they say when they reference the michelson morley experiment. Uh, they say that proved it, or that disproved the ether field uh, existence, which that's not how experiments work. They only show evidence for or against. That's why everything we say we see is, is theory anyway, because we're still you know, discovering and, and uh, uh, experimenting. But anyway, that's the way it went. Okay, so in Miller's work, uh, by far the, the best study person in the field. He had, you could probably categorize what he said is required for laser infer interferometry to study ether. Uh, these were the design requirements, experiment requirements, I should say. Now, just to review the concept of the ether, uh, in ether wind, we have, um, the, the understanding is that you have a, you could consider it a ball in deep ocean, in the deep ocean currents, something like that, where you have, uh, you have the arrows here represent uh, the speed, so the long tail represents high speed, the shorter tails, slower and slower speed. And so as the, you could say, the water hits the planet, it, it becomes entrained and it kind of goes slower, and as it gets over, it's, it speeds up again. Certainly the vertical component would be the uh, pressure of the, uh, of, of the water on the, on the ball. And then if you can see the blue gradient here, uh, the darker gradient is uh, a higher density ether. And the, the, the lighter would be less dense. So if you consider that against, against Einstein's theory of, of uh, general relativity, light bending around a planet, it, we know that in denser materials, light bends a certain way. So if you consider that, then, then that would actually account for out, almost everything he reports in his relativity book about what we see of, of light, light speed and how light, light bends, uh, red drifts, the, and the rest of it. As, as the laser heats up and the sun is, is shining on the components, you, you get, you get uh, heat increasing. And then turn everything off, let it sit, rest, and then it heats up again. And so that's, that's the extent of the temperature changes we saw uh, throughout the day. Here we have humidity uh, throughout the day. Okay, very good. All right, so we're, here we are at the end. Uh, once we have all the data collected, we would uh, uh, take the average, average difference, and we would take the mean, and then find out the difference, the mean of, of all of them together, and find out the difference between the mean of, of each run and, and the entire mean. So ordinate minus the ordinate mean. And so what we saw is this nice uh, you know, down and then up, which is actually what, what we expected to see from the gravitational effect. So this is the, in the vertical orientation, the bottom is in the horizontal orientation. And there was another gentleman by the name of Frank Pierce, uh, he, who reconstructed one. It was somewhat, somewhat uh, I could, not sloppy, but it was certainly makeshift uh, device. And uh, he put it in the vertical orientation, he did his rotations, and we saw also two fringes, left to right. So it sounds like each of our devices are about in the same league, we're around two fringes, movement left and right. So our components are, and he, sorry, he used a granite slab to put the components on. This is a thick, I use a thick aluminum plate. Uh, Grusnik used something similar, fastened differently, but that's interesting because we're all, we're all in the same order of magnitude. So Grusnik ended his experiment a bit early. Same for Frank Pierce. Frank was, he seemed to be pretty, pretty skeptical about the whole thing. He said, yeah, this is just gravity. Stop thinking you're seeing ether or something special here. There's nothing special here, it's just gravity. And so, again, he, he and a couple other folks I thought were too dismissive of, dismissive of it, not really giving it its due. So it appears it is possible to isolate the gravitational versus whatever that double period effect is um, uh, that, that we're seeing. Okay, so there's a picture of the final device. And uh, from my assessment, there is reason to continue the investigation. Whether I do it or not, I've got too many plates spinning at the moment, so I, I don't know if, if, if I would uh, be the one to pick it up at the moment. Maybe later, likely later, but uh, 
priorities first. OK, so we, now we put together the same kind of table that we saw for Miller and the rest of the experimenters, but this is for the horizontal orientation. And we've compared uh, Grusnik, Pierce, and myself against uh, Miller's requirements. And so you can see uh, we're definitely not saying that it's, a, a, it's not null, but it's not confirmed either that it's ether. And we did an estimation of the speed. So Bluetooth connectivity, uh, everything Bluetooth, the, the infrared sensors for temperature on all the components, uh, live video feed into a computer uh, that's doing the analysis where the LabVIEW virtual instrument is. So this eliminates that whole crazy process of data collection where I'm lining things up in PowerPoint and doing the rest of it, uh, which is probably not the most accurate, but I did take my time very carefully every single slide to make sure I could get it as accurate as possible, otherwise the whole thing's a waste of time anyway. Uh, tedious, but yeah, so there, I think that's a, a viable solution, the machine learning and machine vision solution. What else is we'd probably do something like this, increase the light path probably by an order of magnitude, so we get up to 3.7 meters with this arrangement, and that is we, we get it bouncing off one, and then we use these single long mirrors uh, to go back and forth a few times, and then send it back uh, to view the interference pattern. I did see if I could get some of those mirrors made, and I could, so it is possible to do. Why we're not putting a bunch of mirrors here is then you have an actual um, magnification of the gravitational component. So by putting two mirrors here, if they're slopping, then they're slopping with each other. Now you can tighten them down. It's not going to get rid of it, uh, the gravitational component, but it will minimize it. Okay. I couldn't help but notice that in your slide showing uh, the imaginary sphere down deep in the ocean, right. and you were discussing properties of ether, uh, expected properties, uh, the fact that there's a slower speed, uh, slower flow, closer to the uh, surface of the sphere and faster flow at a distance, mm -hmm. um, as well as your example with the pipe and water moving more slowly toward the ins inside surfaces in, in the center. Sure. That seems to me uh, resembles laminar flow, mm -hmm. and that laminar property uh, of an ideal fluid flow versus like a rheological fluid or a Bose-Einstein condensate, not ideal fluids at all, mm -hmm. but an ideal fluid, uh, that laminar property informs the designers of people who design technology, valves and pipes and other kinds of things that handle fluids. Right. The laminar property informs them on how to best control, manipulate fluids. Mm -hmm. Does that laminar property seem like significant in terms of the ether, whether it's measuring, detecting, or uh, hopefully we all hope we can sort of manipulate, capture, and harness right. uh, that, those properties as well? Does that seem like an important property? I'd say certainly so. Uh, from what I, my assessment, this kind of interferometry, that's not going to be the way that we're going to detect ether mm -hmm. going forward. I think there's better ways. Um, I did try all kinds of things with uh, fiber optic cable. Mm -hmm. There was another guy, that, a couple guys that did that. And so I tried with fiber optic cable to see if I could you know, wrap it around right. with, uh, some spools to, to see what's going on there. Very accurate gyros with fiber sometimes you know, can be created. Sure. So maybe that's helpful. I don't know. Sure. Well, I found the light, you know, got reflected too much as it travels through mm -hmm. the, the cable. So you get this, you know, blotch on the screen. It's mm -hmm. not useful. I kind of thought that would happen, but I wanted to see it. Um, but uh, yeah, some other guys they did. It's a, it's a, it's an experiment. I'll probably post the the PDF. But they took, they took uh, three atomic or two atomic clocks, put one on the ground and one in an airplane, mm -hmm. and they traveled against the rotation of the Earth and with the rotation mm -hmm. of the Earth, and uh, certainly they. Assuredly, they, they did see that there was, uh, there was a difference going with the Earth. So if you have that entrained ether, then it's traveling with the Earth a bit more. So you've got, you got slower, less activity going this way mm -hmm. and greater activity going that way because they're going against it. 